It was 2002 at an unnamed school in a dusty and sunny western town. I was headed down a darkened hallway. Behind me, open doors, doors open, flooding the space with light. I walked towards the darkness and I turned and heard click, click, click. Now normally in this town I would fend for my life, but I turned around slowly to see a man wearing not spurs, but bicycle shoes. <laughs> not shaps, but bicycle shorts. His face was shrouded in a dark beard, burdened by a heavy load that turned out to be an ultralight backpack. <laughs> and he carried an open umbrella. Six months later, I'm in a canoe. It's a muggy swamp. The sun was now gone, replaced by a full moon. My guide loses his direction. Mine was gone some time before. Soon he says, I can't find the van. <laughs> I turn to look, but of course my canoe's not a regular canoe. It's a racing canoe that is basically like a log. Quickly, I'm swimming for my life. My head turned, scanning the landscape and flipped the stupid canoe. I find myself in a swampy pond full of alligators. It was here, soaking wet, glasses at the bottom of this damned alligator-lined lake, that I knew this guide I had known for just six months moves through life unconventionally. His artistic practice is often photography without taking pictures. His teaching <laughs> involves storytelling and cooking and hiking. He's been an important mentor to me and other instructors in teaching, art, and life. And I'm honored to introduce our speaker tonight, George Blake. Dear Curtis, it's been quite an adventure along the way, but we have safely arrived at the farm. After stopping for gas, we drove 20 miles down Highway 66 until we realized that George was not in the car. <laughs> we drove back to the station and found him chatting with the owner and enjoying a chocolate soda that the owner had given him. The owner also gave Robert, his brother, a chocolate soda, and off we went again. At just about the same place where we realized we'd left George, Robert began throwing up his soda, so he pulled over to clean up the gooey mess. As I was cleaning up the back seat, a strong gust blew my hat off, and I had to chase it for at least a quarter mile down the road. We are looking forward to you joining us this week. Love, <laughs> Sue. Reinventing the landscape, a, man, a man's relationship to the landscape. So my story is truer than John's. Um, <laughs> I was probably seven at the time, and my brother probably was delighted when they left the gas station that I was in the car, but he was sitting in the back seat with me, or he would have been, uh, so he knew all along. He's like, I can just see him, oh, boy, he's not with us anymore. <laughs> so I had the, the luxury of traveling with my family almost every summer, pretty much every summer, um, as I was growing up from California to Kansas, where the family had... Um, we had family that had farms, and my brother and my dad would help with the harvest most of the time. I was never old enough to drive the combines or do that, so I pretty much just got to play on the farm and be outdoors, which I still love today. Uh, and along the way, uh, or on the way back, we would stop at many national parks, uh, we'd go camping, um, and again, it just reaffirmed my love of the landscape. So I was really lucky to have had those opportunities. Uh, and, and to this day, my, my passion for the natural landscape, which I try to share with the students in my teaching, uh, has continued. Uh, going on night hikes, hiking a thousand miles of the Appalachian Trail, um, pad pedaling, paddling, and hiking. 
So my father did take a few pictures uh, of our travels. Very and, excited. And that is me on the front of the cactus with, with my brother. Um, I, on the other hand, collected postcards uh, pretty much everywhere we went. A collection that I still have uh, to this day, except for the ones that I've used in the art making process, some of which I'll share with you this evening. Also as a child, I was amused by a lot of things, but one of the things I recall being amused by is laying on a bed with my head hanging off the end and looking at the world upside down. Ideal way to see. And moreover, going to the uh, park that we lived near and on the merry-go-round, which was hand-propelled, we would lay on that with our heads backwards while somebody spun it, and that was uh, even double the fun. I also can remember as a child, we had Venetian blinds, and I would, I would go up and down and see the different delineations of the outdoor scene through the Venetian blinds. And, and again, that's very similar to um, all those experiences, I think, affect what I'm making today, what I'm going to share with you today. And this is a picture of my father who, the likeness. who was very much, I'm very much alike him in a lot of ways. Um, this is in his, he's, he's in his late 40s here probably. Um, this is on our block where a, a neighbor welder had built these contraptions. I don't think we ever had a name for them. Uh, but there were several of them and you'd get in, in them and just like you see in the picture, you'd roll them down the sidewalk. Uh, quite dangerous. <laughs> I did a lot of reading as a child, uh, particularly I was, uh, when I was very young, liked the, these kind of books where it had young people uh, sharing outdoor experiences with each other, adventures. Uh, but I couldn't stop with just reading the books. This is a spike kit that I built out of one of those books you just saw, but I still have to this day. Uh, it had matchstick guns in it and, and makeup and whistles and you know, everything a kid would need to play spy. And the other book, uh, it's a bean gun, not a real gun. And that, that craft, too, is very similar to how I'm fabricating uh, my work to this very day. So when Roxanne and I were returning from Burning Man, um, we stopped, and this was all prearranged, at this widow's home whose father, whose husband had, late husband had been a rack jobber. And there were two sheds that looked similar to this, and by all, good accounts, there were as many as 600,000 postcards. And I was able to uh, purchase as many as I wanted for a penny a piece, as long as I bought them by the boxes of 1,000. So we um, first, we, we arrived fairly early in the morning, and our task was to choose cards that I would later construct into art. So I had some preconceived notions about what they should look like, um, although, we're very far removed at that point in time from, from what the artwork exactly is going to be. So this is what we ended up with. There's a uh, hundred boxes of a thousand uh, ready to load in the trailer. Perfect setting. And they weighed 700 pounds, in case you wanted to know. Uh, and about 30,000 of them are now on the walls of 621. So postcards, they were quite popular when I was growing up and in those travels in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. They've waned, the interest in them has waned quite a, quite a bit, un unfortunately. Because now, as we well know, people go with their iPhones or smartphones and they're standing in front of a little faithful and they snap a picture and then instantly send it to their friends. So it's certainly not as romantic as uh, the handwritten postcard. And also, what I think is very sad is it's not going to last as long as those archives of the home-written postcard that uh, probably exist in a lot of your family's homes. I, that data, um, well, I'm real curious what's going to happen to that data in those iPhones. Is it just eventually going to disappear? Um, it probably will not exist for future generations. So this is a panel that exists in the exhibition, and this is one of each of the cards that I have. There's 112 of them. Some of the boxes, it, it turned out, that were, mi were mixed. We didn't really know that um, offhand. So this collection becomes my palette for the work that I'm going to share with you. And so begins my collaboration with Jack Richards, H.W. Red Davis, 
Dr. John Griffin, Manley Fletcher Jr., Don and Ron Bronce, Robert Whitney, Bill Sand, Art Dexter, Laura Dexter, Dan Grigg, Noble Postcards, D&G Enterprises, Elkhorn Enterprises, Natural Color Postcards, Color by Scenic Art, Sun Natural Color Postcards, and Color by Ron and Don Brands, none of whom I've met. Uh, this is the first work that I constructed from the postcards. The, the sky is blue, question mark. And you probably uh, might recognize the space. It was in a faculty show a couple of years ago. It's 30 feet by about 6 feet. And I was cutting off the areas of blue sky on the postcards and then collaging them together. Hugeness of beauty. This is a similar piece. Uh, uh, they're all, pretty much all the work is modular, so uh, I can send the pieces off and they can custom install it in, in their space. And this is an exhibition in Santa Ana, California. And this is kind of in the process where uh, the cut pieces of skies are bound with rubber bands, and then I mix them up and then begin to tape them together. And this one is an, a new landscapes, or what the world would look like when it's flat. And this may be familiar with a lot of you. It was also in a faculty show. Tremendous mass movement. And some details from that. And uh, uh, both these works, the components of those, you won't recognize them. Uh, you may recognize parts of them if you're very observant, but uh, they're all in the 621 exhibition. And this one was Landfall, that was at 621. Unique features. I like the pool of sky on the floor. So um, one thing that my work addresses, it, well, it's simply a critique on photography. Uh, the cards themselves, I find, are very abstract, such as this one. I think that's a very unnatural color, although I think this is the one that was from the Natural Color Company. Uh, easy to say, maybe harder to do. And you, if you look carefully too, you can see the sky doesn't belong to that landscape that they have masked it in and done not. They haven't done it very well, either. Jagged, majestic range of peaks. And this one as well is a different sky that they've pasted in into the uh, postcard. And another, yet another one. Typically seen. And this one, just an amusing aside, uh, in terms of what this man might be doing in front of the, the guys. <laughs> <laughs> Although, it, it probably actually is a Hasselblad that he's, uh, he's using. So, I'm sure you've noticed the screen, the smaller screen to the left, those are uh, about 200 of the panels. I've made over 300 of them. They're approximately three feet by three feet, a little bit more than that. Um, 1,444 square inches to be exact, or 38 inches by 38 inches. Uh, I make them that way because I, I envision overlapping them and so it gives me leeway um, uh, and it helps me engineer the, the exhibit, um, which I pretty much was doing from my studio uh, in North Carolina, just from a floor plan of 6 to 1 and planning out in terms of what I was doing there and how it was going to be months later in a whole different place. I use tape, I, I, I uh, manufacture them or process them upside down and backwards. I uh, figure out a scheme, uh, I make rules, and then I break my own rules. I try to not get in a rut and make them as different as I can. And um, it's kind of like Christmas or opening a present, so when I turn them over I get to see what they look like because I don't, I don't get to see them until the very, very end. Unique. So there are 77 cards. There are seven cards by 11 cards, uh, although some of them are fractured. Uh, you'll see that they're cut up, or I mix cards together. Uh, it's happenstance that seven is my lucky number, and it, it happens, uh, works a lot in my life and in the work. Um, so the, the total square footage that I'm, we're pretty much working with at 621 is over 3,000 square feet. And I bought 60 miles of tape, and I've used half of it. 
Um, I bought a bunch in bulk cheap because it's, I spend more on the tape than on the cards, actually. Uh, and the way I engineered that with the tape, I pride myself in that. You'll see some other works coming up that I use the paper and the tape. I have some works that are uh, put together similarly that are holding up quite well that are over 30 years old. So what's more important than all the numbers that I share with you is the amount of decisions that I make in the process of fabricating the work. Um, so the 1,000 push pins plus isn't, isn't that important, but the tens, tens of thousands of decisions I think are real critical to the work, beginning with the choosing of the postcards, um, and then what's tape next to what, and when I stop and when I go, et cetera, et cetera. Interlaced. And I like the idea of blending, the blending of different locations to form a new imaginary locations. I'm, a, I'm further exaggerating an exaggerated landscape. And for me, it's very much about visual candy. It's about seeing, it's about perception. Uh, I think that anybody, everybody sees the work differently, uh, particularly in the large installation, not so much in these, what I call the panels. Uh, they relate to other ideas and, and of works that I've done, uh, particularly the, the object image or the real versus the representation in photography. Uh, and optical tricks that fragment the landscape's form are, in, are intentionally devoid of gravity. So here's jumping back again. This is from my childhood as well. I collected stamps, and I, I had the same uh, compulsiveness that I used as a tool in the making of the artwork I, I inherited from my childhood in terms of the stamp collection, where not only did I have the stamp collection, but I had to have the biggest and the best and bought out the neighbor's boy's stamp collections, and then I got my grandfather's <laughs> stamp collections. Um, and this is a, a, just a storage. This is in transition before they go into the various different stamp albums that I have. And uh, so I'm sorting by color, I'm sorting by country, I'm sorting by denomination. And it's very similar to sorting the landscapes and sorting the sky and sorting the ground. So I sort of inherited that. And I think that's um, it's something that I encourage young artists to do is understand who they are naturally, which probably manifested itself pretty clearly when they were a child. <clears throat> and then to use that, use those tools in your favor and do things that you really like to do, that you want to do. So I'm going to go through some uh, older work, and th these are uh, ideas that lead up to um, what I'm doing today. And this is my first postcard piece, and these are actually from my postcard collection, and it's simply a comparison. That idea came to me, well, what, why does the sky look like what the sky looks like in postcards? And I begin to just lay them on top of one another and make these very simple collages. <clears throat> so I've always done uh, uh, what I consider idea-based work, uh, and I've always continually reinvented myself as an artist, although I think the different bodies of work make sense in connection with one another. Uh, but you can decide that for yourselves, certainly. Uh, this is also postcard work, and I think this was undergraduate work, I can't recall exactly. If not, it could have been first year graduate school. So I'm overlaying these litho uh, images of the, the gas onto, again, my images from my postcard collection. That's another one. And everything I'm showing you, uh, I, I rarely do one or two. It's usually more like 10 or 50 or 100. Uh, it's like work in series. You know, when it's good, the teacher says, OK, do more of these. I guess that idea stuck with me. Uh, these little sugar packets came, br were brought to my attention, so I was re-photographing them and making 16 by 20 color prints, which in the 70s, which is when this was, um, very few people were working, uh, uh, very few artists were working in color, and in fact at our school I had to go to like the most commercial marketing place where they had the color darkroom because we didn't in the art department. Few art departments did at that point, uh, although it's, obviously it's quite popular now. So these were real fun to make. The first one, obviously, the surfer is surfing the tear. Here could be an earthquake uh, in Yosemite, and also the iconic half dome was, was um, 
the strong t tradition of photographing it, Ansel Adams, and etc. Tornado in the Grand Canyon. And those are uh, uh, aside titles, they aren't the actual titles. And here uh, I had the chance of, um, I discovered a GAF processing lab in graduate school when I was in Philadelphia. And they, they no longer exist, but it, this lab was huge. It was doing it uh, by evidence that I found in the dumpsters that we were diving in after midnight. Uh, I pulled uh, somewhere between 50 and 100,000 photographs out of their dumpsters um, <coughs> and began to make art with it. And here's another blue sky comparison. So the orange is still blue sky, it's just misprinted pictures. And I, I've been, I'd like to uh, invent or explore new formats for the photographic image. And here's one example of that. These are face dots that are quarter inch in diameter, and they're actually punched with a deep throat uh, punch on areas of flesh in the, the aforementioned pictures that I cut out of the dumpster. I also have a version that's face dots, that's just people's faces. Once they were on exhibition up in Connecticut, and people, they were on a pedestal and they were unprotected, and people were bringing me these little face dots to sign to take home the souvenirs. <laughs> And I was quite flattered. There was like tens of thousands of them, so it was not like I was going to notice them gone. <laughs> this thing jumps sometimes. Uh, this was this probably was one of one of my more well-known works of art, and it's again from that collection of all those snapshots. And it's a cubic foot of pictures by by Measure. Um, it's been published both nationally and internationally, and exhibited so much that I actually had to make a twin um, because I couldn't ship the same piece to two places at the same time. And, and both of them now are in permanent collections. And here's another example of an extreme format of photography. This is about 25 feet by an eighth of an inch. It probably is a trim from the rolls they process, but it indeed is photographic image, although not very decipherable. So when I came to Florida, um, literally on our way to a regional SPE conference, and we stopped at off the turnpike to one of the tourist spots to get gas, and, and they had postcards there, and kind of waiting for everybody to go to the bathroom and whatnot. And I walked up to the display, and I grabbed, in fact, it was this very card. And I just grabbed the stack of cards and somehow intuitively just fanned them open. And I liked the repeating edges that I saw. Um, and that led to my first major postcard body of work. But first, here's another. These are I call, call sketches. They're eight and a half by eleven inches, and I made oh, hundreds of them. But eventually, the Florida postcards manifested itself like this. This is when it was last exhibited at the Park School in Baltimore. Uh, it was so much work I had to clone myself, I guess. <laughs> And the strategy for the Florida postcards and what I'm doing with the reinventing the landscape, um, there's quite a difference even though it's the same material and similar method. For one, I'm not cutting the postcards. Uh, the Florida stuff was more about decoration and what I call Florida Dada. Uh, there were many more objects um, in the exhibition. When I could, arrange it live macaws, beach balls, uh, people in bathing suits, uh, birds of paradise. Uh, I never did pull off getting a real live alligator in the exhibit. That would have been fun. And, and if you notice, well, we'll see some details on the walls here. Uh, there's some sculptural, more sculptural like configurations with the postcards, which become much more decorative, I think, than what I'm doing with the landscape. Uh, and and it just the whole choice of cards is different, the choice of how I'm dealing with the cards, different. It lives now under my bed. My bed has to be pretty high, but actually, it, it packs down pretty compact. <laughs> uh, another body of work is uh, uh, about photography itself, and going back to that idea of what a thing is in, in, in life as opposed to what a thing is when it's represented somehow. And here uh, it was a series where I took pieces of graph paper and folded them in half. And on the left half, identified an area that equaled the image area of a Polaroid SX-70. 
and photograph that with a close-up lens. So on the left, we have the actual object. In this case, it's a slice of an apple. And then on the right, we have the same, at the same scale, a picture of that apple. And I still have this work today in the apple. Well, it's hanging in there, but it don't, it don't look so good. <laughs> and this one, uh, a little bit more immediate because the, those pens held the ice cube, as you can see by the picture, which melted in a matter of hours and crinkled the paper somewhat. So they're about uh, the decisive moment, they're about exposure, they're about color, and some were specifically about color in terms of the props I used. All the cliche things you can pretty much come up with in terms of how one refers to photography and how it uh, makes a picture, I address those in this work. Uh, another body of work object image, this one is called lemon, and in fact there is a real lemon in the bottom left, the picture of that lemon in the center, and then this object that you buy in supermarkets that says real lemon. <laughs> and that, <clears throat> excuse me, that was part of a body of work uh, at 621 Gallery. That was my uh, um, kind of first major, no, second major one person show in town because <clears throat> ironically, the first major one person show I had in town was the Florida Picture Show. And another body of work, you may recognize this, it's in the museum right next door here. That's when we had the lovely blue carpet. Um, this set of encyclopedia, macropedia, of the 18 volumes, every picture from that set, that exact set, has been extracted and exists in that, I call it a tapestry. It's, taped, it's just paper and tape together, and they are in order how that extracted them from those books. And this is my yard. A lot of you have been to my yard. Um, I recycle almost everything. Here is an example of my junk mail that's skewered onto a piece of paint pipe. Famous arch. And there are many of these in the yard, and it, it, the yard evolves. And uh, and there are also sections of telephone pole that are at human scale that things are attached to. In this case, it's roach baits. <laughs> and um, this is a 2024 Polaroid of myself, and, and it has its evidence of the objects that are evidence of my consumption and collection habits, which I, I wasn't throwing anything away for many years. I, I, it got to the point where they're going to put me on TV as one of those hoarders. Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to get over it and, and move on to different work. And the lecture, when I lectured, with this work, this is how I looked. <laughs> and that's also uh, how I hiked the Appalachian Trail. This is my, this is how would I hike in. It's my base weight of my pack is less than 15 pounds. That's without food and water. And the umbrella is a real necessary uh, proper accoutrement for hiking in terms of keeping the sun off. And it's wonderful in the rain, particularly when you wear glasses. Sure, Majesty. <laughs> and another uh, Polaroid, this time my collection of bones. And an example of one of the drawers in my house, where instead of throwing this stuff away, it goes into drawers. So I have a wine cork drawer, and I have, uh, well, I didn't uh, identify the aforementioned, the first portrait of me, those were drain plugs, hair drain plugs. I mean, what do you do with yours? <laughs> that was one of my catchphrases when I lectured in that, in that <coughs> mode. Um, I had a chance, I got invited to the High Museum in Atlanta, a Southern Expressions Points of View show. It was a show, an exhibition addressing the landscape. And they knew of other work of mine that they had in mind, the curators, it, 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 but I made a counter proposal. I said, well, this is what I'd really like to do, this new work, which I did. We don't have a very good view of it here. There's about 12 different pieces, uh, on the, one on the floor, one on the ceiling, one is a sphere, which are views from the earth. I took, uh, uh, notable landscape um, books and dissected them and reconstructed them, as well as in the corner there, uh, enough National Geographics that represented every year, every issue that was ever published. So this is my studio in North Carolina. Uh, Roxanne and I bought this land together and built a studio together. And I get to, well, it's, it's more than a studio, but I get to use it as my studio. And that's where I fabricated 
uh, most of the work this summer and also in the winter. And it's wonderful to work there because you're out of the woods, you're off by yourself, the dog can run free, uh, good bit of wildlife, and it's, a, it's just a real happy, comfortable place to be. Favorite attraction. And I strongly encourage wherever you're working to make it a place that you want to be, not a torturous place. I don't believe that artists have to suffer angst. Uh, in fact, uh, quite opposite of that, I think you should be very comfortable and happy with what you're doing, or, or you should be doing something else. Wonderful painting. Now, this is a view from the corner of the deck, looking down into, you can't see the creek in this picture, but it looks down into a creek. And we love it in the winter there, too. That's the same view in the winter. Uh, um, and that's off the other corner towards what we call the little pool with the glider and a uh, place where we can have happy hour up there in that hunting stand. Truly when it's a little, an outdoors <laughs> When it's a little bit warmer. <laughs> so there I am set up and working just this past summer. Um, you can see I, I'm kind of messy on one side and then I make order out of a mess, which is typical of the way I work um, with most things in my life. Those of you who have seen my office or my working spaces. And they're working when it's snowing outside, and even though there's a 30 by 30 foot roof, the snow was so light and the wind so gusty that the snow was literally covering the entire deck, including me, getting under the tape, but I persisted and still was able to fabricate. You gotta warm the fingers every once in a while. Oops. And there's <laughs> one very cold morning. So this, uh, I think, is somewhat ironic. You can read it for yourself, but this, uh, as I was working in that studio this summer, this was in the paper. And I do believe that horoscopes are for amusement purposes only, but I was generally amused by this one. Uh, you may have seen this work. This was in the latest faculty show, and I think of these as sketches. In the process of making the panels, I take breaks, um, play with just pieces that are around, and take them together and put them in little sketchbooks. And these are just some that I picked out. They also, uh, there's 15 of those, 16 of those in the 621 show. So I don't labor over these, they're, they're quick and fun. Uh, but I do spend, I spend more time looking at them than making them, trying to learn from them. Um, maybe they will affect what I'll make later, hopefully. Um, I don't think I could make them if, if they were, weren't fun. <laughs> this jewel jets to the north. Uh, as you probably can tell, I key a lot of the visuals off the horizon line, the, the, the meaning of land to the sky. So this is at my home when I'm working. It takes up the majority of my living room. I have about a 30-foot living room, so that's helpful. Uh, and I have to walk by it many times a day, so I get to think about it, which is okay. That's a good thing. Uh, and you can see the boxes compared to the first picture I showed you are beginning to dwindle. This is my palette. This is 621 empty. Perfect setting. You'll see it much differently Friday if you choose to go or if you go before it closes. Uh, this is setting up, getting ready to install. There's Tyler. He was incredible to uh, help me hang this earlier this week. Uh, and that's uh, what you see on that card. I mean, that's the car load, and that's what covered the walls of the gallery, those rolls. They were, they were pre-sorted to a great extent at my home, but because of the space, I, I could only do so much. So when we get to the gallery, then we just, the first thing we do is pretty much uh, start spreading them around on the floor. Uh, Sue and Sarita and Tyler were very helpful, helping me get the, the show up. Um, It was like shuffling huge cards. I mean, we covered the whole floor. We'd have any trouble walking for a while. This is a, um, 
a sketch of a piece I'd like to make in the future. It's probably familiar to most of you. It's how children, I find, construct the landscape. It's how I constructed the landscape with my Crayolas, with a strip of blue sky at the top, and a cloud, and a, a, a house with a roof, with a little chimney with a smokestack, smoke coming out of it, a dog, and a couple people, and a tree that's just a solid shape. So I'd like to cut up, uh, I envision cutting up the postcards and making these different patches of color in this arrangement, um, probably on the scale of 12 feet by 8 feet. I think it would be a fun piece to make. So back to the panels. Um, I'll show you a few. Um, there's a lot of different strategies, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of their construct. In this particular one, uh, there actually are two different cards that are married together. Unique features. And uh, a lot of these that I'll show you, uh, there's different cards married together. As you might guess, it takes a lot of math to do what I do with these cards, particularly planning the 621 exhibition from North Carolina, just working from the floor plan, knowing how many cards I'm going to need to do what I want to do on what wall and the floor, etc. But I'm sort of good at math, and that part's kind of fun too. When I take breaks, I get out the calculator and start figuring out. <laughs> so I learned recently uh, by an NPR program, and I only heard part of it. Um, in Western culture, when a picture, when you show a picture to somebody in Western culture, say it's a picture of a cow in a field, uh, generally, and I find this to be true once I heard this, that generally uh, you will point to the picture and say, oh, that's a picture of a cow. Uh, but in Eastern culture, when you show the same image, they'll say, well, no, that's a picture of a landscape. They'll see the, they'll see the bigger picture. They'll consider a bigger thing. We, we as a culture, I find, I think it's because of advertisements primarily, we're very object oriented And we tend to think of pictures as objects. I, I found this too, um, in retrospective, in thinking about this, when I studied the idea of the snapshot and wrote my first thesis, graduate thesis on the snapshot, people tend to think of pictures as, they, they don't refer to them as, this is a picture of my grandmother, they say, this is my grandmother, this is my father, this is my car. It's the way we talk. So I can relate to Dr. Seuss a lot, and if Dr. Seuss can have green eggs and ham, if they're allowable, then I think the sky can be on the floor. Also, I'm curious if it's true, if, do real men don't make plaid? I play with my fabrication ideas in a similar way I play with words. Um, and some quotes from Hard Times by Charles Dickens. Very well, said this gentleman, briskly smiling and folding his arms. That's a horse. Now, let me ask you, girls and boys, would you paper a room with representations of horses? After a pause, one half of the children cried in chorus, yes, sir, upon which the other half, seeing in the gentleman's face that yes was wrong, cried out in chorus, no, sir, as the custom is in these examinations. Of course, no. Why wouldn't you? A pause. I'll explain to you then, said the gentleman, why you wouldn't paper a room with representations of horses. Do you ever see horses walking up and down the sides of rooms in reality? In fact, do you? Yes, sir, from one half. No, sir, from the other. Of course, no, said the gentleman with an indignant look at the wrong half. Why, then, you are not to see anywhere what you don't see, in fact. You are not to have anywhere what you don't have, in fact. What is called taste is only another name for fact. Have I created a place where the four compass points meet a connection between heaven and earth, or an axis mundi, or simply a house of cards, he asked himself. Or have I created a scene, a word borrowed from theater, the place where something happens, originally seen meant stage. So I have set the stage, and you will be my audience. As quick as I make a rule in my fabrication of these panels, I break the rule. 
Lost Horizons and Found Horizons. I approached this project in both um, micro and macro uh, as a designer. I think of the work too as an homage to the wallpaper of the 18th century and credit William Morris. <coughs> the panels are not precious and they'll develop beauty marks as they're exhibited, as they already have in transport and with, with push, they're just up with push pins. Um, and to me that just adds to them, it gives them a history. I think of them as pieces to a much larger puzzle, uh, although I do like them and to themselves to a certain degree but they're not unlike a brush stroke is to a painting. I also like, and even as a child remember this, when we went through road cuts in different mountain passes, I like the way those road cuts look, and I think that's influencing some of my decisions in fabricating the postcards. So everyone perceives the work differently, and there's no way to measure that. That's real curious to me. Uh, so I, as you see the exhibition, if you come tomorrow night, uh, I'd appreciate comments in terms of what it is that, about it that attracts your attention. Uh, there's so many different ways to look at it, even for me, you can stand way far back or you can get, put your nose right in it. There's a lot of small pieces that are in play on top of the panels. I had a lot more to put on top of the panels, but actually at one point decided, you know, I think it's, it's what it is, I think it's, it's, I should stop, and I did. Uh, although I may be putting up a few right before the opening tomorrow. More, more to play than anything else. I have other ideas and plans for different configurations. Uh, I'd like to make a spherical uh, ground, like an earth with no sky, and maybe a sky with no earth that looks like an earth. So a lot of it is about the grid, but it's really not about the grid but then it is about the grid. Because um, I like to break, again, break the rules that I make. So I'm really excited about tomorrow's opening. Um, it's almost three years of planning and work coming to fruition. And I'm potentially not showing you what that exhibition looks like. You have to go for yourself. And I hope you're um, pleasantly surprised. And if you didn't pick up on it, what Roxanne was interplaying with her words were adjectives from the back of postcards. And uh, that's curious to me that you get the postcards and on the back they have to tell you that it's beautiful. You can't decide for yourself. Uh, so she was doing that, uh, that wordplay, um, playing off what I was saying. Of course, we scripted this out to a, to a great extent beforehand. But that, if you didn't pick that up, that's what that was about. Um, and of the panels, no two are alike. If you get it, there's no two, no two are alike. <laughs> and then yet another horoscope sorry but it just couldn't help it it was like yesterday <laughs> to see better use the long view it will reveal interesting patterns and colors it will show you how boring stretches beautifully outline and emphasize the busy, busier parts of this picture um, at the opening Tomorrow I've made 200 <coughs> pins, as in you can pin them on to decorate yourself. Uh, I've donated these to 621 um, to encourage donations to 621, so they're free. But you have to wear them at the opening. And there'll be a little like place to deposit, maybe a little contribution. Uh, but they, they will be yours. And uh, there's only 200 of them. And... There's an Art for Dinner event at 621, sorry about the commercials, on the, third, on the 13th, and I'm sponsoring a table, and I, I, I'm supposed to sell tickets at my table, and I haven't sold any. Uh, but <clears throat> you get really special things if you sit at my table, like homemade, you get to taste homemade pork. I'll be making custom-made place marts placemats, guess out of what, that we get to keep, uh, and some other surprises. So uh, if you want to further be charitable with 61 and have some fun, um, see Cynthia or see the website. And I'll take questions.
the, do, and it seems like there's a relationship between your work, the postcards, and these women's beautiful pieces of quilt. They were made out of just scraps of the leftover cloth. Yeah, I've used that reference before. I think there is a strong relationship to, to uh, what I do in making the quilts, yes. Thank you for that, Ben. And here's an animation. And questions? Yeah, there we go. No questions? Yes. Uh, does repetition, what does repetition mean for you? Does that have a particular importance? I mean, it's, you're using these things over and over again, but is right. there something about seeing and repetition? Is that something? Well, I find that a lot in our culture. If you go to uh, any, pretty much any store, that's the way our culture organizes things. And the cans of beans will be on the shelf. Uh, the, pro the produce in the racks and the parking lot. Uh, so by observing it in our culture, then it just encourages me to, to re repeat the re repetition in my work. Uh, I think of my work somewhat as a critique of the culture, and that I'm an observer, and that then I'm reacting to those observations <laughs> and making things that hopefully will make other people reconsider what they're looking at as well. Uh, and it also has to do with uh, my compulsive tendencies, so <laughs> it works that way. Yes? Um, could you just talk about a little bit about the perfection and imperfection of these? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, sure. Um, in some, there intentionally is an anomaly. Uh, when I have a uh, making a configuration where I've decided, okay, I'm going to flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, then usually at some place I won't flip where I should have flopped. And they're, they're real hard to see, because uh, it's kind of like when you read text that's only partially there or read misspelled words. Uh, certainly, I just tend to, to read it correctly, you know, like panels, for instance. Um, we, our mind tends to correct mistakes. So um, in the Florida Picture Show, almost every panel had what I call the anomaly, the mistake. And it's not unlike the, is it the Hopis who do uh, make an imperfection in their weavings because only their deities is perfect. Um, but somebody, a colleague, pointed out to me this summer when I was making them that it became too much like Where's Waldo? <laughs> so uh, that people will come and just look for the anomaly. So now the anomaly is the anomaly. And uh, you really have to look for them, I guess. <laughs> but you have to look at a lot of other things before you get to that point. Is that what you meant? Yeah. And in the process, if I made a mistake, rarely did I go back and correct it. But I always kept a razor blade there just in case. That I just, well, I guess that's just going to happen. Let it, go, let it go. And that's kind of hard for me, you know, being compulsive sometimes, but um, just let it go. Yeah, Stevie? Um, I don't have a good memory of this, but um, I believe there's a very short movement in the 1980s that involved Miriam Shapiro and the pattern movement. Um, have you heard of that and would you consider yourself a part of it? Yeah, I don't align myself with any group really. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've heard Miriam speak uh, and I wasn't very far when I said Tyler, a graduate of Tyler, I heard her speak in the mid 70s. Uh, I wasn't particularly enamored by what she was doing but I learned some things from her. And one thing that I learned clearly from her that was reaffirmed by my professors, is you don't have to really explain something that you do necessarily very thoroughly. Sometimes it's okay just to say, well, I like doing that. It's okay that she liked doilies and she was making these complicated, <coughs> intricate patterns of doilies because she liked it. And that was good enough. And that was a good lesson for me. Yes, Sarita? What was the deciding factor to either continue or stop making them? I know you had a lot of panels. Was it because you had the cards? Well, I haven't stopped making them. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, there was just a time factor, and, and I knew I had enough to uh, 
cover the gallery. And in fact, we went going up instead of six, talking at 16 feet, we went up to 20 feet. Um, so besides going up to 20 feet, I had like exactly the amount of panels. And when what we decided to do on the floor, I mean, it was sort of it was very serendipitous at that point. But we wanted to go up to 20 feet, so I made uh, I think eight, eight or nine additional panels to go that additional distance up. Yeah. See? Excuse me. <coughs> What's going to happen when you run out of cards? Oh, uh, <laughs> I've only used 30,000 of the 100,000. So, uh, uh, I don't know if I'll ever get to those. <laughs> yes? How long does it generally take you to construct one of the um, panels? Uh, if everything goes perfect, which it really does, I mean, the table stick or, or uh, I'll, I'll, I'll not get the cards quite butted up against each other or whatnot. I, I've, my fastest, my, my record time is 20 minutes. And that's of the very simple ones using the whole card. Uh, and, and that's just like, okay, ready, set, go, and everything's right there, and I, and I go, kind of in a race. Um, on, on average, it would take well over an hour, some of them take two or three hours, especially when I'm cutting them diagonally or into smaller pieces. Uh, they get quite laborious. And again, that doesn't count the planning, the transport, the getting materials, all of which is part of the artist's uh, chore. John? This is kind of a good segue. In your life, there's sort of an element of uh, or endurance, <laughs> how do you see that in relationship to this exhibition? Well, I think the, it's kind of like running a marathon. I use that, I've been using that metaphor a lot the last few days or weeks. Um, you have a goal and you've, then you need to fulfill that goal. And to fulfill that goal, you, you've got to start working yesterday, not tomorrow. And uh, it takes a lot of planning. Art, I believe most things really have to do cooking, uh, uh, backpacking, most of it's fishing, most of it's all about preparation uh, and, and then posturing yourself and then, and then the hard labor. Like running a marathon is, I've never run a marathon. It's like you got to do a lot of serious training. Um, so you know, to, get, to, get, to get in my mind to figure out what I needed to do for the exhibition months ahead of time in a space that was 500 miles away that I just had a floor plan of. Uh, and then that became the marathon. It's like, okay, well, the marathon is covering the walls of 61, and uh, I've got plenty of time, I've got a year, but I'm gonna start doing it. So in that sense, if that makes sense, that's, it, it is, it's very similar. And it's about efficiency too. Um, and again, I pride myself in, in my planning, although we all make mistakes, but that shed, for instance, that you may have noticed in the picture that I built in North Carolina. So I bought everything here that I thought I needed for the first stage, which was primarily almost the entire shed, tools and everything I needed and put it in a trailer and pulled it up there. And I didn't have to go to the store for the two weeks I built the shed. I had everything I needed. <laughs> <laughs> and that's hard to do if any of you build things. My uh, friend who's a contractor, he was quite jealous of it. He's always got to go to the My neighbors, who are very good friends, they can go to the store every day. Oh, I've got to go get some screws. It's like I would never drive 20 miles just to get some screws. I would just wait and do something else. <laughs> Roxanne and I are planning a backpacking trip to Big Bend in a couple weeks. We've been working on our backpacks for months. For one, for one, we want to get them down to probably less than 12 or 15 pounds, certainly, because uh, you don't want to carry a lot of weight because you're going to be walking all day. Every little ounce counts on your back. So it takes a lot of planning. You know, we get a gram scale and we weigh everything. Is this jacket lighter than this jacket? Is this sock lighter than this sock? <laughs> it all adds up. And it's, it's a process that I think is very similar to, the, for me, the art making process. And it's fun. I mean, I, I like getting the gram scale out. Go, which sock is lighter? <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want to know about the hundreds of dollars I've spent. Like, I just bought a pair of pants that are 3.2 ounces. Like, you know, my other ones were four and a half ounces. <laughs> and a 
a 3.2 ounce jacket. It has a full zipper. And my other jacket was heavier and didn't have a full zipper. And they weren't cheap. Maybe that's a good note to end on. <laughs> so I hope to see people at uh, 621 tomorrow. Um, tell me what you think. And thanks for coming tonight.